Hi guys, today we're going to take on a question from Warren. Thanks for writing in. Hi Matthew, I have two questions for you that I hope you could try to answer, both relating to two different friends of mine. Number one, when analyzing the heart rate of my one friend, I see that the, her heart rate shoots up to zone five within minutes at the start of her runs. She stays in zone five for the duration of her runs unless she starts walking. This is despite running at a slower, fairly comfortable pace. In February, she completed a half marathon and she spent 90% of the run in zone 5 with an average heart rate of 174 beats per, per minute. What type of training would you prescribe to improve this and allow her to run longer and keep her heart rate lower? Her half marathon time was 2.34 and 45 seconds and her heart rate was above 167 BPM for 2 hours and 28 minutes of that. One goes on to ask another question about shin splints, which I'm going to come back to. And thank you for this question, Warren. It was super interesting. I spent most of this week sort of reading about it and looking into different ways we might be able to tackle it. I came up with a fairly detailed answer and I've written it all down in a, an article now and I'm going to sort of talk through that. But if you want to see the images that I'm going to refer to in the answer, you can just click on the show notes for this episode. So if you look in the description, there'll be a link that says something like click here to see the full show notes. And then you can see the images and stuff because there's going to be some graphs and things like that that I'm going to refer to. But you should be able to understand it just from the audio. Uh, if I explain it well. So, high heart rate when running. Now, before we start, I did a little bit of practice, like presenting this, and I've, I've discovered that saying heart rate, especially high heart rate, and especially high heart rate when running is really tricky. And I'm not particularly awesome at like presenting or speaking, but it, it comes out like you start to like W your Rs, like heart, high heart rate when <laughs> so if I do that right I'm not going to edit it out we're just going to go with it and you'll have to forgive me but it might happen <laughs> so okay so we're going to high heart rate <laughs> high heart rate when running nailed it there's kind of three parts to it right so we're going to tackle it in three different sections the first part is we need to look for a mechanical issue that might be giving us bad heart rate data. The second part is we need to look for a medical issue that might be causing an unusually high heart rate. And the third bit is to look at getting customized zones for this individual. Warren, I'm afraid I don't know your friend's name, so hopefully you'll see this, Warren's friend, and I apologize, I don't know your name, so I'm gonna just refer you to you as Warren's friend. So, the first bit, we need to look for bad heart rate data. So if this heart rate, average heart rate for that half marathon came from a watch, and a wrist-based heart rate measurement, then I wouldn't trust it. The trouble is with the watches is they tend to wiggle around, even the very good, very expensive ones, you know, there's, there's hair on our wrist, they tend to wiggle around as we run. The faster you work out or the faster you move, the less accurate they become. They're not bad, um, especially at slower heart rates and slower paces, but I wouldn't trust them for something like setting my training zones. I might use them if I'm going to just try and stay in my zones and I just need to be roughly in the ballpark, but if we're looking to actually set the zones up and get accurate data, that especially if we're going to discuss it with a doctor or something, then we need accurate data. So I'd have to say the first thing is first, you've got to get a chest strap and make sure that you're getting accurate data. So the heart rate measurement from the wrist is not going to work. We need a chest strap and we need to be pretty sure that the heart rate data that's coming in is accurately reflecting what the heart is doing. So that's the first thing. Look for a mechanical issue. If that's the problem, then, you know, it's, it's not an issue. That being said, many people have a high heart rate when exercising and it's nothing, it, it just is higher, right? So we're going to answer the question as if that's the case here. Next up, we want to rule out a medical issue. So I already 
sent you back an email, Warren, as you know, and hopefully you reached out to your friend. This is an unusually high heart rate. I think the average you said was 174 for the half marathon. That's very, very high. It may indicate a medical issue, and it's certainly something that needs to be looked into by the appropriate medical professional. I'll probably start with your family doctor, uh, explain the situation, and just see what they think. They may order further tests, or they may send you to a specialist, or they may be happy that it is okay the way it is. Whatever the case, it's not for me to decide based on the information I have, and it needs to be reviewed by a qualified medical professional. If that's the case, so we've ruled out a mechanical issue and we've spoken with the doctor and it's been checked appropriately and we're happy that this isn't a, a significant medical issue. Now we're in the situation that a lot of runners find themselves where they just have an unusually high heart rate. And at the other end of the bell curve, there's those runners with an unusually low heart rate. And we can apply what we're going to talk about next to either scenario. So if we look at any population of people, a significant sample of a group of people, you know, the average heart rate when exercising might fall within a certain range. And the average max heart rate is something like 220 minus your age. And that's where that formula comes from. The trouble is that some people at the end of the bell curve have a much higher heart rate than that when exercising and some people have a much lower heart rate than that and most people sort of sit in the middle of the bell curve which is fine and you can use formulas like 220 minus your age or I think the Maffetone method which I don't know a ton about but I think it's something like 180 minus your age for your threshold heart rate those methods don't work when you're at either end of the bell curve whether your heart rate is you know, unusually low or unusually high. So what do you do in those scenarios? Well, first you check that it's not a mechanical issue. Then you check that it's not a medical issue. And if you've ruled out both of those things, then you come to how do I determine my training zones for heart rate, accepting that my heart rate doesn't fall within the middle of the bell curve and mine in this case is unusually high, but the same rules apply if it's unusually low. So why do we care? about heart rate zones? Well, the question really is, why do we care about training zones at all? The reason that we care about training zones is that at different intensities, we'll have different physiological effect on our body. If we're looking to do, say, the Sunday long run is it's a typical one, right? So you're going for a long run, you're training for a half marathon, so it might be like two hours long or maybe even three and your training plan you says you have to be in zone two. Now, if you do that training run, the long run in zone one, you're gonna under stimulate the body and you're not gonna get the physiologic, physiological, excuse me, adaptation that the training plan is looking for. If you go too high and you go into zone three, the same thing, you're going to be having a physiological effect on the body that is not the intended um, effect that the training plan is looking for. And if you look at most training plans and most of the elite athletes, they tend to spend this 80-20 uh, distribution, which some of you may have heard of, which is where you do 80% of your working out in zones one and two, so the easy zones, and 20% in zones three, four, and five, which are the hard zones. And the reason that distribution works, I'm not going to sort of go into too much, but essentially what you're doing, if you're training for a half marathon or a marathon or anything longer than about 1500 meters, we need to be stimulating aerobic system development as opposed to anaerobic system development. Hopefully we all still remember that stuff from, um, from high school, right? <laughs> so, we want to know our training zones for heart rate or pace or power, if you're talking about biking, so that we can stick to our training plan because the training plan will be set up with this distribution where it'll have sort of 80% easy and 20% hard or something like that, or at least something intentional with a distribution of training across the intensity spectrum. It's not going to be all in the middle, right? And what you often see and what the research shows that there's there's a sort of sinkhole in the middle where most people seem to spend most of their time in zone three, which is the threshold zone, which we're going to come to in a minute. And when people do that, they're not 
stimulating the physiological adaptations that would take place if they run easier for longer or if they run harder for shorter amounts of time. So everything's in this kind of moderate intensity and it's very important that we try and spread our training across a training intensity distribution such that we maximize the effects of our training on our performance. And it's really good, Warren, that you and your friend are thinking about this because a lot of runners, especially recreational runners, who is, you know, like me, we spent, uh, who I spend most of my time consulting with, they, they tend to fall into this zone three trap, right? We tend to go into this um, zone three almost, ha this moderate intensity has this sort of gravitational pull that you sort of default to. And the reason is that it feels comfortably hard. You can keep it up for a long time, you know, often up to an hour or more, but it feels like you're working out. If you go a bit easier into zone two, that's the conversational pace type zone where you can talk comfortably. And what you often find is that people don't feel like they're doing enough, right? They, and they feel like they're underworking and that's gonna hamper their performance, which isn't actually true, but that's the feeling. And if you go much over zone three into zone four, then you can't go for very long. If you, once you creep into zone four, you might only go for you know a few minutes or maybe 20 minutes and it's really quite difficult. Okay, that's your kind of 5K pace kind of zone. So, the thing about the zones and the thing that is important to keep in mind is that they're not pace zones, they're not heart rate zones. Pace zones and heart rate zones are proxies to tell us where we are in relation to something called the lactate threshold. So the lactate threshold is the point at which lactate starts to accumulate in the blood. Now this gets a little bit technical, but if you bear with me, it is quite helpful to understand. So as we're exercising, if we're going really easy, we're generating a small amount of lactate in the blood. As we increase the intensity, we start to generate lactate more quickly. When we're in that easy um, intensity, the body can clear the lactate out of the blood more quickly than it's being generated. So obviously the lactate doesn't start to accumulate because the body, as quick as it's being produced, the body's removing it. As we increase our intensity, the lactate rate of generation goes up. It's harder for the body to clear it, but it can still do it. And we're still below the lactate threshold. At some point, we will start to generate lactate in the blood more quickly than the body can actually remove it. Obviously, at that point, if you're producing more than you're removing, it's going to start to accumulate within the blood. Anything above that, and if you, go, if you continue to go quicker and quicker, the lactate will accumulate faster and faster. So the point at which the lactate only just outweighs, sorry, the lactate production only just surpasses the lactate removal, we call the lactate threshold. The reason that's important is because that's essentially when the clock starts. As soon as you're producing more lactate than you can remove, at some point soon, that lactate is going to accumulate to a level where you can't continue running at that pace. At the lactate threshold, we can continue for about an hour, but once we go a little bit above the lactate threshold, we will stop sometime within the hour. And if we're very far above it, and we're going really intense, we can't go more than you know, 10 or 20 seconds because we're producing lactate far quicker than we can remove it. So if we've got our lactate threshold, we put that at the top of what they call zone three. That's our um, threshold pace. So it depends on the system that you're using in terms of zones, but the different systems are all based around this one marker, the lactate threshold. So if we know the lactate threshold, then we know relative to that, which zone we're in. If we're very far below it, we're definitely in the easy zone and we can go for hours and hours and hours without having to stop. If we're going at the lactate threshold in terms of intensity, we can go for about an hour and it'll be pretty hard, but we can keep it up for roughly an hour or a little bit less. 
Once we go above the lactate threshold, we can only go for a certain amount of minutes, maybe even seconds if we're really far above it. The heart rate and the pace and the power are all proxies for our position on the intensity spectrum relative to the lactate threshold. So when we're running at a pace that's very far below our threshold pace, then we are not producing much lactate, we can remove it quite easily. If we're running at a pace that's very far above the lactate threshold pace, we, excuse me, it's very far above the lactate threshold pace, then we're generating lactate far too quickly and we're gonna to have to stop pretty soon. So we can see what we really need to know is our training zones relative to our lactate threshold, be that pace or heart rate. The pace and heart rate are just proxy measures for how far above or below we are the lactate threshold because that'll determine how long we can continue at that pace and our ultimate finishing time. So what we really need to know is the lactate threshold. And we would like to know the lactate threshold heart rate and we would like to know, know the lactate threshold pace. So if we can work that out for you, Warren's friend, then we'll be able to give you individualized training zones. So because your heart rate runs higher, we need to know what your lactate threshold is and work out the training zones as percentages of your lactate threshold heart rate, not 220 minus your age or some other fixed number that isn't specifically customized to you with your unusual heart rate, right? So how are we gonna work out the lactate threshold, heart rate and pace? Now, there's a few different ways of doing it and I'm gonna talk through three of them. So one is to get a, a lab test done. Another is to use the, you know, a race result and we have some of that information. So I had a bash at that to, to give you somewhere to get started. And the third one, which is the one I recommend and the one I do myself is like a fitness test or a field test. So the first one to get a lab test. Now, this is the most accurate way to determine your lactate threshold, heart rate and pace, but it's expensive and we should be doing it every four to eight weeks. We should be um, reassessing our threshold and thus our training zones to make sure that if our fitness goes up or down, we change those things accordingly. That, so if you're having to pay for an expensive lab test every four to eight weeks-ish, then, you know, it depends on your budget and how seriously you're taking it. Certainly professional athletes do it, but do recreational runners like us do it? I don't personally, but it's certainly the most accurate way you can do it. Just for reference, what happens if you do go and get a lactate threshold test done is, well, you can just Google it and you'll find some um, testing facilities near you. It's, they're usually in most major cities. They'll have you run on a treadmill at a slow pace initially, and they will be monitoring your heart rate, your pace, and your lactate concentration. So the way they monitor the lactate concentration is they uh, prick your finger and they measure the concentration of lactate in your blood at a regular interval, let's say every minute. I don't know exactly what it is. Then they start to speed you up. As you speed up, you'll produce more lactate. So the concentration in the blood will go up a little bit. But if you're still running slowly, then you'll be able to clear that lactate out of the blood as quickly as you're generating it because you're below the lactate threshold. So it won't start to accumulate within the blood and it'll just rise a little bit, but it'll look pretty flat. The concentration of lactate will remain quite flat during that time. As you speed up further, once you sort of reach the zone three kind of pace and then cross the lactate threshold, you'll be producing lactate more quickly than you can remove it from your blood so it'll start to pool and collect in the blood as we talked about earlier once you go over that pace over that threshold it'll start to accumulate very quickly so what they'll do is they'll keep getting you to speed up and speed up and speed up until you can't run anymore and then you'll stop you'll stop because the lactate concentration in the blood is getting really really high and you can't continue then what they do is they plot the results on a graph. So I don't know the X and Y, I always forget, but the up one will have your concentration of lactate that they took from those measurements. The one across the bottom, that'll have the pace and or the heart rate. So let's say they take the heart rate first. What they'll see as you're going slow is a relatively flat reading for lactate concentration. As you speed up, 
you'll cross the lactate threshold, it starts to accumulate and it'll start to go up almost exponentially but very quickly before you eventually have to stop. The point, at, it's almost like a sort of hockey stick kind of graph, so that point at the, uh, the sort of inflection point where it starts to rise quickly, that's your threshold, right? Because you started to produce lactate quicker than you could remove it, that's why it started to accumulate and the concentration went right up. So that's your lactate threshold. It's a little more complicated and they do some like clever sums to figure it out exactly, but that's basically the gist of it. And if they want to know what your lactate threshold heart rate is, they'll look at that point on the graph and then they'll tell you. And if you want to know your lactate threshold pace, all they do is plot the pace across the bottom and look at when the lactate started to accumulate at that same point and then they read the pace at that point and that's your lactate threshold pace. So that's how lab testing works. So what we want to be able to do is try and determine that same point for heart rate and pace, the lactate threshold, but without having to do a lab test, that's the idea. So this next one's where I spent most of my time this week. This one was a little tricky, but it was kind of fun. I enjoyed it. So what I wanted to know is, can I take the information I have and work out some rough estimates for your lactate threshold heart rate from what I've got? Now, I know you're, I'll have to presume that one, this isn't a medical issue as we talked about. Two, it's not a mechanical issue. The heart rate readings are accurate. And three, that the you're at the same fitness level as when you did this half marathon. So presuming it was like last week. So that, uh, close enough so that your fitness level hasn't changed significantly. We know your half marathon time. So from that we can work out your half marathon pace and you can just plug that into a pace conversion chart as I did. And I go through all this uh, step by step on the show notes for people who want to follow along because it gets a little tricky here. So I'll try not to lose anybody. But from that half marathon time of two hours 34, I think it was, the half marathon pace is seven minutes and 19 seconds per kilometer, okay? Now we go to something called the 80-20 zone calculator. So anyone who's heard of Matt Fitzgerald, who's awesome, he writes really good stuff. He has this website called 80-20 zone calculator and has some cool calculators on there that help us figure out our training zones. So we can plug in the half marathon time and we when we do that, it'll give us some estimates for pace zones. So you can see in the image on the show notes, I plugged in two hours 34, and it took that and worked out my, sorry, the, um, it took that and worked out the training zones, the five training zones, and it put the 719 minutes per kilometer right in the middle of zone three. Actually, it's not right in the middle. It's just towards the lower end of zone three. It put the top of zone three at six minutes 51 because it estimates that that's where your lactate threshold pace is based on your pace for the half marathon. See how that works? Now, it estimated the pace for your threshold at six minutes and 51 seconds. So now we have an estimate for your lactate threshold pace six minutes 51, and we have an estimate for you, uh, sorry, we have an accurate measurement for your half marathon pace, seven minutes 19. We know your average heart rate during the half marathon. I'll have to look it up, I think it was 174. Yes, it was 174 beats per minute during the half marathon. So we know your half marathon pace, seven 19 minutes per kilometer. We know your half marathon, average heart rate, 174 beats per minute. Now we want to know, if anybody heard that in the background shaking, that was socks, <laughs> my dog. Now we want to know, what is your threshold pace? Well, we just got that from the calculator. It said it was six minutes and 51 seconds. So now we have three of the four values. We don't have the lactate threshold heart rate. So can we take those and work out the ratio between them? So what I did is if we take the pace, the lactate threshold pace of six minutes and 51 seconds, and we convert that to speed, it comes out at 8.8 .8 kilometers per hour because I, I can't work out ratios when I'm using minutes per kilometer. It's too complicated for me. But if I change it to speed, like kilometers per hour, then I can work out the percentages a little bit more easily. It's very hard to explain this. It was hard for me to do. I'm not very good at maths, so 
in, in the UK we say maths, not math. So I, I might flip flop between the two ways of saying it. And actually, if anybody can check my math <laughs> on this, I would definitely appreciate it because I'm not sure it's accurate. So we know your half marathon speed was 8.2 kilometers per hour because that's seven minutes, 19 per, minutes per kilometer. We know, your heart, we know your threshold pace was 651 minutes per kilometer. That translates to 8.8 .8 kilometers per hour, just using a, a pace conversion app, right? So we know your half marathon speed was 8.8, .8. sorry, your threshold speed is 8.8 .8 kilometers per hour. Your half marathon speed is 8.2 kilometers per hour. We know your half marathon heart rate is 174 beats per minute. Now, 8.2 is 93.2% of 8.8. .8. Okay, so I just did some sums to work that out. I think I'm right. So if we take 174 beats per minute as 93.2% of 187. So what I did to get that is I took 174 beats per minute. I divided it by 93.2. Then I times to buy 100 to get 187 beats per minute. So I think, if I'm correct, that should be an estimate for your lactate threshold heart rate. So lactate threshold heart rate is 187. Lactate threshold pace is 6 minutes 51 or 8.8 .8 kilometers per hour. And I think now we've got them. So that's how I did it. And I hope that's correct. And that should give you a reasonable estimate for your threshold heart rate and your threshold pace. You can just go ahead and use your threshold pace if you want, just by plugging in your half marathon time to that 80-20 calculator and then go off pace zones. But it's a good idea to have pace zones and heart rate zones and effort zones and power zones because all of these things are proxies for the lactate threshold. So they don't tell you exactly where you are and they'll change with time and with uh, weather conditions and with sleep and, and all these things can affect the zone. So if we try and have a few measurements, it makes us a little bit more likely to get in the correct zone physiologically using these proxies. Now, 187 beats per minute for a lactate threshold heart rate is extremely high, right? It may be that that's inaccurate, right? It may be inaccurate because of the measurement, as we talked about at the start. It may be inaccurate because uh, there's a medical issue that needs addressing, right? So it's not a usable number, but say it is. It's, it's very high, it's, it's close to, I think it's, it's near my max heart rate, and it's a threshold heart rate, right? So what I would be at the top of zone five, you are at the top of zone three, the lactate threshold. So it's, it's a very high number. That being said, we can take that number and using percentages of that number, we can work out your training zones. So we put that number right at the top of zone three, because we know it's your threshold, and then we take percentages off to work out what your zones one and two are and add percentages to it to make zones um, four and five. That's all very complicated. You can do it yourself using the percentages if you just look them up, but it's easier to use a calculator. So there's a few calculators online. I took some of the more common ones and I put in that lactate threshold heart rate to estimate your training zones. So all of this is in the show notes if you want to look up exactly, but if you look up the um, 80 20 zone calculator and ended the lactate threshold heart rate of 187 beats per minute. We get our five training zones. Um, Matt Fitzgerald's system for this has an X and Y zone that you don't um, enter, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to talk about the five training zones. So it says that your range of beats per minute for zone one is 135 to 151, for zone two, 151 to 168. For zone 3, 178 to 187. For zone 4, 191 to 196. And zone 5 is anything over 196. So now we have some training zones that are based on an estimate, a reasonable estimate for your lactate threshold heart rate that is specific to you and not based on an arbitrary number of 220 minus your age, which doesn't work if you're at the extremes of the bell curve like you appear to be. So you can go ahead and use those, or you can then <laughs> You can use one of the other systems. So there's there's a few. I don't know them all. Uh, I know uh, a couple in Training Peaks, like Andy Cogan, 
and he has a five training zone system. I think this is more based on power from bike testing, but I don't know tons about that. That's things for me to read in the future, I guess. But his training zones, you know, zone one is up to 128 beats per minute, zone two from 129 to 156, zone three from 157 to 176, zone four from 177 to 197, zone five from 198 to 255 according to this, or above 198 essentially. So you could use those five training zones. They'll be different because there's different ways of working them out and it's always a proxy. It's a proxy for our relationship with lactate threshold. Lactate threshold is the determining factor as to when we'll stop, how fast and how far we can go. And another one that you may have heard of is Joe Friel's training zone. So he has five training zones, but then he divides zone five into A, B, and C, which are sort of progressively more difficult. And I'm not going to read the numbers out again, but if you want to know the numbers, just go and look on the um, show notes for this show, or you go to Training Peaks yourself, put that threshold heart rate in of 187 beats per minute, and it'll tell you your training zones. And I think those are all reasonable estimates. Next, we're going to talk about determining lactate threshold from fitness testing. Sox has decided to join me on the sofa for the last part of this question, right buddy? I don't think you can see him if you're listening to the audio or even if you're watching the video, he's down here. But he's looking quite wonderful today. Anyway, let's get back to it. So, the way I'd recommend determining your training zones is to do regular fitness tests. So I usually do mine, I mean, they say every four to six weeks. Truthfully, I usually do mine once every two months, every eight weeks. And I usually do it on the down week. So I do a sort of four week macro, uh, what is it? Micro, macro cycle, meso, the one in the middle? I don't know. <laughs> I do four week training blocks. So I go up, 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 down, and then I do that again. And on the second down, week I do my fitness test again and there's a few different fitness tests you can use to estimate your lactate threshold and I actually think this is probably the best way to do it for me it's more practical than going to the lab it's cheaper it's more accurate than using race pace estimates actually the first one is based on a race pace estimate but the others after that are based on the actual fitness test and they're quite straightforward and easy to do and I think that's the best way to do it you'll get a decent estimate for your lactate threshold, heart rate and pace, and it will be current. And what you can see over time is a, any kind of change, you'll spot anomalies. If you have four results and one of them is way off, then you can disregard it, and so on and so forth. Socks got down, okay, bye buddy. <laughs> so the first method, which is actually based off a race predicted lactate threshold pace, is you put your lactate thresh, sorry, you put your race time into one of the calculators like the 80-20 zone calculator. I believe Macmillan running has a um, zone calculating system based off this uh, finish time also. But you use one of those calculators to get your estimated lactate threshold pace and then you just take that lactate threshold pace. So one for your friend it was 651 minutes per kilometer and you run for 10 minutes at that, where you warm up first, and then you, once you're warmed up, you settle into a pace of um, 6.51, and you start your watch, or whatever you're using to track the run. Then you maintain that pace, or around that pace, 6.51, for about 10 minutes, and then you stop the watch, or the app, or whatever you're using, and then you take your average heart rate during that time, presuming your average pace was 651, which it should have been if you were keeping an eye on it, or thereabouts. And then you take your average heart rate, and that average heart rate will be your lactate threshold heart rate. So that's a simpler way of doing it. It's a little more accurate, but it does rely on that race finish time to estimate the lactate threshold pace accurately, which it may or may not do, you know, if it was particularly hot that day, if you had a particularly good day, a particularly bad day, it might be off a little bit. So these other fitness tests are a little more accurate, I think, and these are what I use. <clears throat> so as we mentioned earlier, when you're at threshold and lactate is just about being cleared by the body, we can sustain that usually for about an hour. And actually, it apparently works to just do an hour time trial 
take your average pace and average heart rate and that's pretty much a lactate threshold pace and heart rate. The trouble is, is you have to go as hard as you can. So you have to do an hour time trial and that means you have to finish the hour as strong as you started it. It has to be an accurate representation of your best effort for a whole hour. Psychologically, that's very difficult to do. And you know, those four week training cycles or <laughs> six weeks or eight weeks is what I do. You really don't feel like doing that every eight weeks. Personally, I've never done it. It sounds horrible. But if, if you're really into 10Ks and stuff, that might be a <laughs> good way to do it. If, if your sort of psychology is set up and you think you can do it accurately, right? I think I would struggle with that. I think I would struggle to go as hard as I could knowing that I'm just doing it for calculating my pace zones. I'm not gonna be as motivated as I would be. Say if I did a 10K race or a 15K race, race I think I'd get a better time that would mean my average pace, my average heart, average pace was higher. Uh, sorry, my average pace was better and my average heart rate was higher. So motivation plays a big part in these fitness tests and you have to be careful of that. So, the, But the one hour time trial is a decent way to get your lactate threshold and heart rate and pace if that's the way you want to go. Another easier way is the one recommended by Joe Friel. Uh, so if you don't know Joe Friel, you should look him up. He's got loads of interesting stuff on this and he's, uh, I believe, one of the co-founders of Training Peaks as well. And he wrote the Triathlon Training Bible in which he described this test and essentially it's a 30 minute time trial, so half as long. And what you do is you take your average heart rate and pace for the last 20 minutes of that time trial. So depending on how you want to set it up. You can either look at the data afterwards or you could start the watch 10 minutes after you've started the time trial. But again, it has to be a 30 minute max effort. It has to be the best you could do for 30 minutes. So that's quite tricky too, but that's a fairly accurate way to gauge your lactate threshold, heart rate and pace. And your lactate threshold, heart rate and pace will be the average of the last 20 minutes of that 30 minute all out time trial. Another way, which is the way I use, and I can't remember where I got this from originally. I've seen it written on Training Peaks. I've heard it on that triathlon show, which is an excellent podcast that you should all check out. And um, I think I've heard Matt Fitzgerald talk about it too. I've heard it a few times that if you do a 20 minute time trial, that your lactate threshold will be about 95% of the heart rate and speed for that time trial. So say I do a 20 minute time trial and I just go as hard as I can for 20 minutes running around a track or something flat like a course near a river. And my average heart rate was, let's say, 150 beats per minute. My lactate threshold should be about 95% of that. So I just take 150 and times it by 0.95 and that will give me my lactate threshold heart rate. Um, 142, just based on, that, that's an estimate. I'm not sure what my actual, I think my lactate threshold is about 145 at the minute, I can't remember exactly. To calculate my lactate threshold speed using the 20 minute time trial, I say speed because it's going to be easier for the maths, but if we take my average speed during that 20 minute time trial and say it was 14 kilometers per hour, my lactate threshold speed is going to be 95% of that. So I take 14, I times it by 0.95, that gives me 13.3, I've already done this. <laughs> and then I just put that into a pace conversion app and 13.3 kilometers per hour becomes four minutes 30 per kilometer. Now I know four minutes 30 per kilometer is my lactate threshold pace. And finally, this is a new method to me that I'm not familiar with, I haven't tried, but apparently um, I think it was one of the guys on one of the articles on Training Peaks recommended this one of the coaches from Training Peaks, sorry. And a three minute time trial, you can take your average heart rate and pace for the last 45 seconds, and that's a reasonably good estimate of your lactate threshold pace. I'd be really interested to try this because, you know, the 60 minute time trial for me is just undoable on a regular basis. I know I'm not gonna do it, and I'm certainly not gonna do it with enough enthusiasm to get an accurate result. 30 minute time trial is hard. That's the one Joe Friel recommends you take the last 20 minutes as your average heart rate and pace and that'll be your lactate threshold heart rate and pace. Again, doable for me but harder. 20 minute time trial, I like. I've done it a few times. Well, I've done it lots of times and 
It usually gives me re fairly reliable data, 95% of that for my speed and heart rate is my lactate threshold heart rate speed and then I just convert the speed into pace. This three minute time trial, I think I could do that accurately, I could do that um, regularly, sorry, with very little difficulty. So if I could do a 20 minute time trial perhaps and get my lactate threshold heart rate and pace from that and then do a three minute time trial maybe later in the week, take the average heart rate and pace for the last 45 seconds and see if they match and if they do and I repeat that a couple of times I think that'd be a really good way to do it because it's way easier to do a three minute time trial than a 20 minute time trial and uh, it'd be good zone four workout anyway. <laughs> so. They're the different ways that you can work out your lactate threshold from fitness testing and as I say, if your fitness is changing quickly then you want to do it about every four weeks and if your fitness is fairly steady I would say do it every eight weeks. Eight weeks is usually what I do. Honestly it's more that I, it's pretty unpleasant. <laughs> I, I'm not really built for that kind of testing, it's not the kind of running that I enjoy but you know people who are more into 5Ks and 10Ks, uh, they'll really enjoy that. It's just like a race simulation type of a test. So just to sum up, if we have an unusually high heart rate, the first thing we need to do is rule out mechanical error, which is we're using a wrist-based heart rate measure or we're somehow getting bad data. We want to make sure we're getting good data, so a decent quality chest strap, uh, and then test that against your pulse as well. So I would um, look at, you want a live reading on the heart rate, uh, get the heart rate up a bit, and then do a six second pulse check times that six second pulse check by 10 and you'll have you know 180 beats per minute and if you want uh, your chest strap also says 180 beats per minute you, you can be reasonably confident in the equipment that you're using. Then you want to rule out a medical issue because that is an unusually high heart rate we want to make sure that there's nothing going on there. If there's nothing going on and you're just one of those people who has a higher heart rate when exercising then we need to determine your lactate threshold heart rate and pace because that determines your training zones not your actual max heart rate or your resting heart rate. Once we know the lactate threshold heart rate we can work out the threshold excuse me we can work out the heart rate training zones. Once we know the lactate threshold pace we can work out the pace training zones and we're going to use those and we're going to retest every four to eight weeks and that should allow you to do zone based training based on heart rate or pace. I would recommend a little bit of both and yeah, hopefully that was helpful.